who's going to talk about and maybe I failed to make it. So the next speaker is Mark Selke, who's finishing up at Stanford and then will join IAS and Harvard. Recording in progress. Now we need the recorded music. Do, 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 do. We are experienced. Oh, okay, okay. That worked. Good. Okay. Good. So, <laughs> Mark is going to talk about robustness and isoperimetry. Mark, take it away. Okay. Um, th thanks so much for uh, inviting me and uh, coming today. Um, so, people can hear me okay? Okay, great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I'll talk today about a universal law of robustness via isoperimetry. And um, this is a uh, joint with uh, one of my advisors, Sebastian Bubeck, who's at Microsoft. So the uh, purpose of this talk is to say something about uh, very large machine learning models. Uh, so just to give a sense of why is this is a pertinent topic, uh, you know, machine learning models have uh, been getting extremely large uh, very quickly, uh, as probably uh, most of us are aware. And to just say a bit of comparison with kind of the statistics story from 10 or 15 years ago, um, uh, classically, when we think about um, how large our statistical model should be, uh, we think that the number of parameters should be kind of just right. So maybe if there are too many parameters, we're going to overfit, and if there's too few parameters, we're going to underfit, and there should be some kind of Goldilocks zone. And if we think about kind of the extreme of choosing too many parameters in a way that would be sensible, we would think that, well, if we're fitting n data points, then uh, at most, we're solving an equation, so we should need n parameters. And um, this is really not the case for, for large modern neural networks. So just to show some numbers, uh, if uh, you look at the MNIST data set, these are these uh, digits here. There's uh, like 60,000 images, uh, a pixel. Uh, an image has uh, 1,000 pixels, maybe. And um, typical model will use something on the order of a million parameters, so it's, it's a lot more than 60,000. Uh, similar story for uh, ImageNet, all the numbers are bigger, uh, and the parameter number is even way bigger. And, okay, if you look at these recent large language models, it's even up to almost a trillion. Um, so, uh, there's a pretty um, prominent and successful uh, story that has uh, shed some light on this, which is not what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, but I want to just um, mention it first, so, so uh, just as a contrast. So um, this story is saying that when uh, I have a lot of data points and they're in high dimension, maybe these two large numbers are comparable, then it's kind of fine to have mild overparameterization. Um, so there's uh, quite a few uh, works on this. Um, the last one was... Um, uh, talked about a few days ago. Uh, so there's these uh, curves where if you look at a larger and larger model size, then um, you improve, then you overfit, and then you, uh, you go back down again. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a specific setting in which uh, it seems like extreme overparameterization may be mandatory. So for example, in um, double descent, often theoretical analyses will say that well, if you overparameterize by a factor of 10, that's, that's fine, that's good. Um, and here we're going to really want to overparameterize by a super constant factor. Okay, so um, let me say what the setting is and what the result is and um, what's going on now. Uh, so I'll give an informal um, statement. Uh, and kind of, it's, it's trying to reconcile the following three phenomena of neural networks. Uh, the first is that they're overparameterized. Uh, the second is that they often memorize their training data uh, almost perfectly. And the third is that they um, generalize well to uh, the same type of test data, but they are brittle against adversarial uh, perturbations at test time. So if I, if I add a little bit of adversarial uh, label noise to this image, I can't tell it apart, but it uh, gets classified very differently. Um, so our result says that if you want to memorize and you want to be robust, then you need overparameterization in some uh, theoretical model. So to give an informal statement, which I'll then um, 
explain more carefully for the next few slides. Uh, we're gonna fix a reasonable function class uh, described by some number P of parameters. So this is something like a deep neural network with some fixed architecture. So every trainable weight in the network is a parameter. Um, we're going to sample uh, N data points, IID, from a D-dimensional distribution. Uh, so it can be fairly general, but it should be truly D-dimensional. So it shouldn't be like a, a line living in D dimensions, but it can be some kind of Gaussian, uh, not necessarily spherical. And then we're gonna add label noise. Uh, we're gonna have some maybe deterministic labels and we're gonna add some noise. And then we're going to try to memorize the labels uh, and we're going to try to do this using a function in our function class that we fixed beforehand and we're going to want this uh, function to be Lipschitz, which is our proxy for robustness. And the result is that we're going to need at least order n times d parameters in order to do this. So if our function class does not have enough parameters, it will not contain a robust memorizer. Um, so in short, uh, overparameterization may be necessary for a robust memorization. Okay. Uh, so let me um, now explain in a, a bit more detail um, what I'm talking about uh, with all these things. And um, you know, please ask questions as I go through this technical setup. Uh, so, so we're gonna be living in D dimensions. Uh, for now, we'll just say we have data on the unit sphere as we'll see it can be relaxed. And uh, you should think the number of data points is something of polynomial order in the dimension. So um, pretty flexible, linear is fine, cubic is also fine. Um, the labels are something uh, deterministic, this function G, which we don't really care about. Um, and crucially, we're going to have some noise. Uh, so each label YI will have some noise ZI. Uh, and the noises need to have some average variance uh, sigma squared. Um, so the noise distribution can even depend on the late, on um, the input xi, it doesn't, it's pretty um, unrestrictive. Uh, we're, so we're gonna think about memorization. So we'll say a function, uh, a classifier f fits the labels perfectly, that means it's a perfect memorizer, right? So that makes sense. And um, we'll also be even fine with partial memorization which means that you fit the labels uh, including some of the noise. So you, you fit the labels better than just ignoring the noise. Um, so, so for example, if our mean squared error is less than half the noise level, then, then that, um, that counts as memorization. Okay. Um, next, what is robustness? I'm gonna say a classifier is uh, robust if it has a small Lipschitz constant. Okay, um, so this is, uh, sufficient condition for any sort of robustness. It certainly implies that if I um, change my input a little bit, then my classifier won't move very much. Um, it's a bit of a strong uh, condition, but it's convenient mathematically, so we're going to define robustness this way for the purposes of this talk. Um, and I wanna point out that the scale here is uh, constant. Um, so our inputs are on the unit sphere, our labels are constant order. And so it makes sense to hope for a dimension-free um, Lipschitz constant here. So um, this, uh, this has caused some occasional confusion, so let me just say, um, if you're thinking about a real image, uh, maybe you think it has uh, d pixels and each pixel is an order one number. Um, so the scaling seems a little strange. But if you just rescale down, all this is saying is that if I change 1% of my pixels, then my classifier should not change very much. It's, it's kind of, it's saying a, you know, a small relative change in my input should, should be benign. There's no, there's no funny games going on. Um, okay, now uh, a fact is that if I have some random uh, data set, some random x, i, y, i pairs generated this way, then there's going to exist a perfect memorizer which is uh, O of one Lipschitz. And the reason is just that all of my inputs are separated because I have random inputs in high dimension. And so I can, I can just do something very simple. I can take a sum of bumps. So for each uh, input point xi, I can put a bump function supported uh, right around it and um, just, just fit xi but no other points and just do this for each input um, separately. Okay, so very simple, very silly, not what we wanna be interested in. Um, and uh, okay, so the simple construction is uh, Lipschitz because the, the points are separated. Uh, it's a perfect memorizer, but it uses a lot of parameters. It uses n times d real parameters 
because to specify this function f here, I have to tell you every single coordinate of every single um, input point xi. So in terms of parameters, it's, it's you know, much less efficient than you would uh, think should be possible. And what we're gonna see is that um, you know, this is the, uh, the best parameter efficiency you can get, already this uh, silly construction. Um, so I, I, don't, I certainly don't want you to think that, the, oh sorry, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so each xi is a point in d dimensions. Um, and in this function f, we, we're using all the points x1 through xn to construct the function f. So, so that's nd real numbers. Aren't they the input points of your problem? Uh, yeah. But, but the, the idea is um, we're, we want to think of fixing a function class um, with some number of free parameters before we see our data set. So, so um, we, we need to, right, so, so in order to be able to find such a function like this in our, in our function class, um, we need to have all the functions of this form for all possible points xi. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, thanks for the question. It's a, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, subtle, the, the, um, the setup. Uh, any other questions? Okay, great. Um, okay, so yeah, it turns out no function class is more parameter efficient, uh, and let me now say what I mean when I'm talking about parameter efficiency a bit more precisely. Uh, so when I have a function class specified by p parameters, what I mean is, Abstractly, there's some parameter vector in p dimensions and each function in my class um, corresponds to some parameter vector. Okay, and I need some regularity conditions for this to make sense, otherwise my parameter could, vector could just be one dimensional because I, I can biject it with any set. Uh, so we're going to require first that the parameters are bounded in norm by some constant I'll call j, and uh, second that the parameterization is uh, j Lipschitz in the sense that if I change the parameterization vector, then the classifier changes in L infinity norm by at most j times this uh, amount of change. Okay, um, so the eventual dependence on j is going to be logarithmic, so, so if j is d to the 10, that's completely fine. So, so I think of these conditions as being quite benign. And uh, on the other hand, these conditions uh, do let us prevent silly pathologies because I, I can't extract infinitely many bits from a single real parameter when I have these kinds of uh, regularity conditions there. Uh, so just as a simple uh, first example, if I'm looking at linear regression, then my uh, functions are going to look like this, they're just inner products, and um, the number of parameters is gonna be the dimension of the original space again. Okay, let's look at a more realistic example of this setup. So. Uh, let's look at feed-forward neural networks with, um, the, so, so these are given by linear maps uh, composed alternatively with um, nonlinearities uh, alpha, for example, the ReLU. And uh, in our setup, the parameter vector W is going to encode all the entries in all of these uh, weight matrices here. And uh, some very nice thing about our setup is that if you have a structured matrix, like a convolution, there are a lot of repeated entries. Um, this correspondingly decreases the number of parameters. So I can just treat it as one uh, coordinate in my parameter vector. And uh, if we think about the Lipschitz constants uh, in this case, um, both the Lipschitz constants in the parameterization and the Lipschitz constant of the classifier itself uh, are gonna be upper bounded by a natural quantity, which is the product of the um, uh, operator norms of the weight matrices. So um, the Lipschitz constant in uh, W is kind of what we need to be reasonable, that's this uh, number uh, J, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, the dependence is logarithmic, so, so basically you can think that as long as the, um, the log of this product of uh, norms is, is reasonably sized, we're, we're in good shape. So, so in particular, as long as the, the depth is not uh, insanely large, um, this, this is uh, very well handled by our setup. 
And often this norm project is also explicitly controlled for other reasons, like to ensure training stability. Um, any questions about uh, this or anything else I've said in the past couple of minutes? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so it turns out there's a, there's a trade-off here. So if you, if you don't care about robustness, you just want to memorize in the setting I've described, you just need n parameters, even with a two-layer neural network. Uh, but uh, as I've said, you need n d parameters to robustly memorize, which is achieved by this uh, sum of bumps, a uh, very simple function. And uh, it, if you try to improve, uh, it's not clear how. So the general trade-off here uh, was first conjectured for two-layer networks in this previous paper by Bubekli and Nagaraj. And our main result is a, a very general uh, form of this uh, trade-off. So the setup is that we're going to fix a function class described by p parameters. Uh, let, let me just say they have poly d size. In general, there's a log j. And we're going to have a data set with noisy labels. So uh, as a reminder, this means the, the xi's are iid, say on the sphere, and the yi's have some noise in there. Uh, then for any memorizer in my function class, uh, its Lipschitz constant has to be at least of order sigma root nd over p. So again, sigma is the noise level in the labels, uh, n is the number of examples, d is the dimension, uh, p is the number of parameters. In particular, to get a dimension-free Lipschitz constant, I need to have at least nd parameters. So that's the, the main uh, takeaway. Uh, in my uh, setup before, I said that the x size should be a uniform on the unit sphere, uh, but they can actually be a lot more general. Uh, first, you can have any distribution satisfying isoperimetry, something like a log Sobolev inequality. I'll, I'll say what that is on the next slide. And um, also, you can have a mixture of um, like almost n different distributions, and it's still fine. Uh, and uh, you can also have data dependent label noise. Um, you just need some expected noise level. So it's um, you know, some, like half your data set can be no noise and it's fine too. Uh, this trade-off is also tight in general, um, not just at the endpoints, but, but at any number of parameters basically. Um, and the reason is that you can project down to some intermediate dimension and use the same kind of sum of bumps construction there. Uh, okay, so let me now say what I mean by isoperimetry. Uh, so this is a key property of high dimensional space. Um, and the basic uh, definition is that any Lipschitz function uh, concentrates extremely well with Gaussian tails, right? Uh, sorry, I think the minus sign is uh, merged in with the fraction bar in the numerator. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so this is a common property of high dimensional uh, distributions, so spheres, Gaussians, uh, some uh, slightly more exotic distributions and um, and it's implied by having a good log Sobolev constant. So it's a, it's, it's a strong property, but it's, it's sort of um, generic-ish in high dimensions. It's, it's, not, it's not like a very rigid property. Um, okay, so uh, as you can maybe tell, uh, this, um, we tried to make this uh, theorem kind of realistic and not, not such a spherical cow result. Um, so let me now try to say a bit about um, what, how, how you could try to tie it into practice. So, so certainly real data sets are gonna be mixtures, so maybe uniform on the sphere is not very realistic, uh, but I can think my data set has a cat component, a dog component, uh, maybe um, some slightly more specific versions of these components, uh, seems fine. Uh, and uh, in order to, uh, you know, we're not going to know what the dimension is. That's, a, that's kind of a, a tricky thing in trying to think about how to, how to apply this in practice, right? Um, you have some number of pixels in your image, that's obviously a very bad notion of dimension, uh, but you could hope to say that there's some effective dimension, there's some data manifold, um, and, and the result would hold with that uh, effective dimension. And uh, this uh, leads to some possibilities of uh, extrapolating from large, uh, to large scales from small scales and so on in various ways. Um, what is the noise? So, so in, in theory, in the setup, uh, if there's no noise, there was nothing for us to learn. So if I, had, if, if I had this problem with no noise, then I would just need one function in my function class because there would be, there would be no memorization to do. Um, and, uh, yeah. 
So, um, so we wanted to fix a function class beforehand and then see our random data set. So if our random data set had no noise in the labels, then we could just, we would just know what function to use. So like kind of, um, like this is really looking at memorization. So, so and one, one interpretation of what memorization is is um, like memorizing noise. So that's kind of uh, the setup. So, so um, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue that um, memorizing noise is good, um, but uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to get a theoretical problem, and uh, if, you, if you don't have a good understanding of, like, a priori of, of what your um, data set is gonna look like, uh, it may be a reasonable um, way to think about, um, you know, modeling it. Uh, so, so for example, um, just w one story uh, that's related is the called the long tail hypothesis. It says that in a large data set, uh, a significant fraction of the points will be kind of uh, isolated. So there's kind of a long tail in the, the cluster distribution in your um, data set. So a lot of the, the images will be kind of unrelated to other images. And uh, maybe their labels can be thought of as noise um, from kind of a learning point of view. Um, but it's certainly an assumption that would be nice to um, remove uh, in maybe with a slightly different uh, setup in the result. Um, let me just uh, quickly say that uh, for, if you look at the scale um, that this uh, type of prediction leads to, you do get something realistic. So this is very um, naive. Um, it, you shouldn't trust any of these numbers. I, I just want to show that they're, they're kind of on the right order of magnitude. So um, what you can do to try to extrapolate is you can look at MNIST. This is a relatively uh, small model, or small data set. And uh, so empirically, good robust accuracy uh, is achieved at something like a million parameters for this model. Er, yeah. And what we can do uh, if we want to extrapolate is we can say uh, this means the effective dimension should actually be 10, even though the naive dimension, the number of pixels, was 1,000. And there's this, uh, so the, the discrepancy between 1,000 and 10 is 100. So maybe we try to uh, just port this over. And we say for ImageNet, we're gonna use the same constant 100, we're gonna scale everything up. Uh, so you could think of many other ways to do this extrapolation, but I just wanna say that um, this does give something at the right scale for current practice. So, um, so this is like um, a relevant scaling that we're looking at. Okay, uh, let me just uh, briefly say something about the proof and then uh, wrap up. So um, I'll, I'll give a proof in a very simple setting where uh, the labels are pure noise and they're just IID plus minus ones. Um, so the first step is we're going to uh, assume that the labels end up being balanced. So they're not um, too biased. And um, this is uh, going to hold with high probability and it's only going to be assumed once. So we're going to use a union bound later but um, we're just gonna assume this once and it won't get amplified. Um, so what does isoperimetry uh, tell me? It tells me that for any uh, fixed uh, function in my class, which is Lipschitz, uh, either the function is unlikely to be minus one or it's unlikely to be one. So one of these, is, so either minus one or one is achieved by my classifier on a very small fraction of my total state space. Um, so just, uh, you know, concentration of measure on a sphere, if I have some, like, linear function on the sphere, this will be true, for example. And um, this means that if I fun fix this function f first and then I look at my um, random data set, uh, it's quite unlikely to output both labels in kind of a balanced way on my data set. Uh, it's going to have a e to the minus nd scale probability to do so because one of the labels is achieved on a very small fraction of the state space. Okay, so this means that when we just um, union bound over our function class, we need at least e to the nd labels in order to be able to memorize these uh, noisy labels. We need at least e to the nd parameters. And um, Roughly speaking, a, a p parameter function class is like an e to the p sized uh, discrete function class. Uh, so um, based on the way uh, things were set up, uh, you just uh, do a union bound over an epsilon net of your function class. So it's, it's actually not a very technically sophisticated uh, proof. Uh, just to mention, um, 
if, if you want to do mixtures here, you just assume balanced labels within each component. And if you want to do partial memorization, uh, you just use, um, you just think of adding sub-Gaussian variables in the right way instead of, um, instead of kind of the combinatorial way of uh, thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, let me, yeah, let me just uh, skip to the end maybe uh, and mention a few uh, open directions that I think are interesting. So uh, one is to think about um, non-Euclidean uh, geometries. So kind of abstractly, the, the result still goes through, um, but it's much less clear to me uh, like in what cases it's reasonable to think of this uh, isoperimetry property uh, defined in terms of concentration of Lipschitz functions as kind of a realistic or reasonable thing. Um, it would also be very interesting to understand uh, what changes for different notions of robustness. Maybe the Lipschitz constant can be weakened. Uh, so one, one natural thing to think about uh, naively is the Sobolev norm, so the L2 norm of the gradient. Um, but this doesn't lead to anything interesting at all for this setting uh, because even this silly sum of bumps function, it has an extremely small Sobolev norm because it's only um, supported on a very small fraction of the state space. So it's important that we're using the Lipschitz constant and not a Sobolev norm. Um, but there may be other ways of getting around this. Um, finally, it would be interesting to uh, see uh, what happens with different architectures. Maybe it's possible to prove different, more refined laws uh, to compare with, with, uh, you know, with um, how, how the state of the art evolves as, as models continue to grow, and um, to try to prove maybe a result that takes training dynamics into account uh, instead of just a uniform bound over a function class. Um, so thanks very much for your attention. Uh, let me know if there are any final questions. Any questions? Hello. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, um, I've, so, uh, if you can. Okay, some noise. Uh, if you consider the um, the effective dimension of the manifold as you were suggesting, you you expect that you further decrease a lot the number of data points that you have in your uh, in your set. So, uh, what uh, it seems to me that nowadays we are able to so the number of parameters we have is uh, way above the limit that you need to have this uh, robust uh, classification. So I was wondering if. Do you think it is a dynamical problem? So are we reaching the solution or we are ending up somewhere in the, the space of parameters? Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, that's a good question. I'm, I, I mean, I, I'm really not sure. I, 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 yeah, I think it's true that, um, if you, especially if you think of maybe also an effective data set size as well as an effective dimension, even this lower bound might, um, you know, still not be getting up to realistic levels. Um, so I think on one level, you can just think of it as a philosophical result saying, maybe it's not crazy to use lots of parameters, maybe there's some justification. Um, I think, um, but it's also, you know, even a better or more refined lower bounds might be possible with training dynamics. Um, so one thing is there's this um, phenomenon that often uh, you want to train a very large model, but then you can remove a lot of the parameters afterwards. Um, so what we have here, um, the, the lower bound uh, applies also to the number of parameters you end up after sparsifying. Um, so so it, it doesn't distinguish between the number of parameters used during training and the number of parameters in the final model at all. Um, but uh, yeah, p potentially a, a version that is um, taking training into account might be able to do that. That would be extremely interesting. Any other questions? Yes, I have. Is it audible from Zoom? Sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, can you hear me? Is it clear? Uh, yeah, yeah. F from Zoom. There was a uh, parameter called alpha nonlinearity. Can you uh, please go to that slide once? Uh, yeah.
Okay. Yes. In this, uh, actually, what is the stability condition? Because if we are trying to introduce the nonlinear uh, nonlinearity in the system, it holds for some bounds, right? What is the upper bound and the lower bound for this? Um. Uh, so, so maybe you're saying that I'm I'm uh, assuming that my nonlinearity is one Lipschitz here when I write this product of matrix norms. Or yeah, what is the condition it holds actually to be a valid to be in the same data set? Uh, sorry, I, I don't understand the question. Okay, I I'll just try to be very precise because we are trying to multiply here with nonlinearity. Values, right? If I am correct. Uh, yeah. Are you talking about the product of norms on the bottom, or the definition of the function f? Or uh, the f of x. F of x. Okay. Okay. Great. So w d multiplied by alpha and w d minus one multiplied by alpha. So what is the condition for stability for the nonlinear signal, nonlinearity? Um, or it's just a function which we are just trying to multiply with nonlinear. So, so it's composition, it's not multiplication, uh, first off. Okay, okay, fine. Because I was thinking that it is being multiplied. Okay, it is a composition. Okay. Yeah, sorry, yeah, it's, it's composition. So you're multiplying by a matrix and then you're applying a nonlinearity to every entry and then you're multiplying by another matrix. What, what kind of nonlinearity is being considered in this scenario, actually? Um, it's kind of anything that's, uh, let's say, one Lipschitz. That, yeah. Okay. So, so there are a lot of standard nonlinearities used in practice. Uh, I mean, the ReLU is the most common, but you can make up all sorts of variations as well. But, I mean, they're all nice Lipschitz functions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the talk. Uh, concerning this um, effective dimension, if you have a kind of hidden manifold, do you need this effective dimension to scale linearly with the ambient dimension, or like can it be a little O of the? Um, it, it can be anything. It can be anything. And the, yeah, just okay. but because um, it, it's just the log Sobolev constant that enters in. Okay. And does your result say anything when the? Perturbation is at the level of the examples rather than the label, or is it like much harder to look at that? Uh, do you, and do you think that the same final result would apply, or is it specific to label noise? Uh, yeah, um, that's a good question, and I'm not sure. Yeah, if the if the noise is on the the inputs. Thank you, Mark. Uh, quick question. So you, you showed the double descent uh, curve in the beginning. I, I was just a little confused. Could you comment a little bit on the how, how you see the connection of the of your result to, to that literature that uh, shows double uh, descent? Uh, I, I was just um, trying to say that um, there's a lot of work on you know over-parameterization over at large. Um, uh, this is a flagship example. Um, and uh, I think um, a mostly unique feature of what I was talking about is that it's looking at a much larger amount of over-parameterization. So in most of these results, you're thinking about over-parameterization where the, there's just a constant factor or something. Um, yeah. And, and maybe a quick, quick follow-up. Uh, could you comment a little bit on uh, your last point on how you think that SGD training could be taken into account in this framework? Um, I don't have any proof ideas, if okay. that's what you're asking no, about. No, that's just, you know, like maybe insights, okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would expect that you would want to start with some very specific model and stuff, and you, you know, like, like, you know, when we were thinking about this, we were also starting with a very specific model, but somehow things became much more general, but it's hard to imagine that for a result on SGD training, I think. Thanks. So I do have also one. Um, so this is about scale of the data. So what happens if you actually consider data that lies on the still d-dimensional sphere but has norm square root of d, and say you also scale up Norm the, what? Uh, square root of d, say. 
Yeah, sure. So that everything has, uh, every component is theta of one. Yeah. And also you scale up the label noise. Would you, so, so I'm, I'm wondering how the result changes. Um, you just need the, you, not, you just need to blow up the Lipschitz constant by root D, or if you still insist on having theta of one, what would happen? Uh, yeah, so, so I guess um, the way I'm thinking about it, uh, yeah, maybe let me find the slide. Uh, the way I'm thinking about it, there's kind of a natural um, choice of Lipschitz constant scale to aim for once I give you the scale of the inputs and the outputs. Right, so what I want for robustness is if I change my input by a small amount, like relatively to its norm, then the label should change by a small amount also relative to its scale. So, so th you know, that, that's, a dim that's kind of a very uh, clean way to just describe what's happening and, and everything will go through if you just use that scaling. Thanks. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. So you had some examples at the end of realistic real networks and comparing MNIST and uh, ImageNet. So were these networks also robustly trained? Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, the, the uh, result I was looking at for MNIST is this uh, paper by Madri and his lab on um, robust classification and uh, they used, you know, projected gradient descent training and yeah. I, I mean, the, you know, they did not verify the Lipschitz constant or anything like this. They just uh, found that it was difficult to find adversarial examples, right? But. More questions? Thank you. Um, do you know how to compare this result with the result of the, uh, the, pre the previous talk in the sense you have lots of regimes in which you have this kind of uh, clustering phenomena between uh, some neurons or parameters, which in the end might, you know, you, you enter the heavily overparameterized regime, but then you end up not being overparameterized anymore because training effectively reduces the number of uh, parameters. How do you think that connects with what you discussed? Um, yeah, I'm... Let's see, so. Yeah, I, I'm really not sure. Uh, I, I haven't thought about this, but uh, I, maybe we can talk afterwards if, if you'd like. Um, I, I feel like I shouldn't try to make up things right now without having thought about it. All right, final question, and then group picture. I was trying to understand your result compared to the double descent curve because in that case, even you go to the optimal generalizing error, the regime is the sample size is proportional to the number of parameter. So from this robustness uh, concern, do you know in that regime this model is not robust? Because you have a lower bound on this, uh, this parameter size, but that's not a regime for double descent curves. So I want to see is there any explanation for that? Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think when you um, are doing, so, so, yeah, so maybe we just think about linear regression for double descent. So, um, if, you, if you're doing uh, linear regression over the sphere, then um, kind of, uh, the natural scale of, of a classifier is is going to have a Lipschitz constant that's like square root d uh, for me, right? Because I, I want a typical point on the sphere to get a non-trivial label. Um, yeah, so so I, I think the it, it's a bit strange, but um, if you if you uh, think about linear regression in the context I was talking about, then it's kind of not robust. Um, if I you see, if you want a random point to get a good label. But I mean, even in that setup, when you increase the number of parameters, you won't get any uh, robust, uh, robust classifier. Uh, I mean, you'd have you to- You always keep the constant at the root end in, in that case. Um, uh, yeah, that's right. So, so this is just, um, I, I, I think th this model is not very suited for linear regression on this sphere. Yeah. Okay, thank you. 
All right, so let's thank the speakers once again.